So, uh, yes, I was just saying that uh, we can see if we can get to the end of the chapter on disputes today, but without any pressure or hurry at all. Uh, because the main purpose of these groups, it's not really a class, it's more of a discussion so that we can bring these teachings to our lives and to our, um, for our contemplation in a way that really means something to us and that feels relevant and, um, and uh, yeah, relevant to our lives. So we're actually, when we finish this chapter on disputes, there's only a little part of this book left. So I also thought at the end, maybe I'd ask you what you think about the next chapter or the next book that we do. But when I come back, we actually still have to finish this one. But I'm already thinking about uh, carrying on these sort of discussions, maybe with another compilation or maybe even with some straight sutras that are quite powerful and important sutras in the in the Pali canon. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, just reading all the other welcomes because it's nice to read from everybody. So thanks for sharing. Um, so please forgive me today. I have only my mobile phone because I'm on my way to uh, a period of four months retreat, actually a month in America and three months in, in Australia, all being well. I can never count my chickens till I'm on the plane. And even then, you never know. So uh, apparently if you get to the retreat center in America and you test, they test you for COVID. And if they, if you test positive, that's it, finish. You have to go. So <laughs> I could yet be homeless somewhere in the States. Um, so I have the sitter on my phone because I didn't want to carry the book. And I'm a little bit harder of sight than I used to be. So please forgive me if it's hard to read. I'll do my best. And uh, for Celeste in particular, who is new here, then uh, I tend to read through a little bit, maybe give some comments, but at any point you can raise your hand. I'll also be pausing at various places throughout the reading so that you or your cat, who is very comfortably positioned around your neck, can ask questions. <laughs> it's really sweet. <laughs> who needs a hat? <laughs> Okay, so I don't even know the page number because, ah, good, someone else put in, it's page 137, and this subject is called The Root of Disputes, and this, I just had a little glance through it, and I thought this was quite interesting, because here it's talking about um, the way that disputes can arise and cause disharmony in the Sangha, which means the ordained Sangha, um, who, of course, try to adhere and practice a higher form of um, sila, so a higher level of conduct, a more refined level with more attention to the ways that we relate and, and, um, and even refer to one another. So obviously, sometimes watching monastics interact um, is not so inspiring if there's bickering and quarrels, right? But if you see that monastics relate to each other with respect and with kind of goodwill and recognizing one another's strengths and not so much picking on the faults, then it can be a cause for great confidence and it can also be a model for how we might learn to relate to one another too. Of course, that's not always possible. Monastics are human beings just like anybody else and there are arguments. And uh, although I haven't seen myself many really intense arguments, I've certainly felt friction in communities and there's often the case where two people just don't see eye to eye. Um, but hopefully these are all places that we can look at within ourselves and see how we're relating to that. You know, are we actually allowing resentment and disrespect to take hold in our hearts? Um, and so it's quite interesting to read this because it's uh, in a way pointing to refining our virtuous conduct a little bit more. Um, and of course, when you do live in community, you don't really get away from the other people. You're actually having to practice with these people, eat with these people, even serve the same people that you might be irritated with. There's no going home to your friends and family, you know, or going out to the cafe. I'm not going to say the pub. <laughs> There's no actual distraction from what's happening in the monastery. So if there are kind of rifts and tensions there, it does affect one's practice. It's not as though you can go somewhere else to meditate. You know, you might be in the hall with them. You might even be seated next to them every single day uh, because you tend to sit next to the person you were ordained with. So, and sometimes you're coming from completely different backgrounds and have nothing much in common other than the robe. So, uh, so anyway, 
I shall read through this and I'm sure we can probably relate it to our lives, maybe our workplaces, maybe even to our families. And uh, invite your thoughts and reflections as well. So this is called The Root of Disputes. Monastics, and I usually change monks to monastics. There are these six roots of disputes. What six? Number one, here a monk or a monastic is angry and hostile. When a monastic is angry and hostile, they dwell without respect and deference towards the teacher, the Dhamma and the Sangha, and they do not fulfill the training. Such a monastic creates a dispute in the Sangha that leads to the harm of many people to the unhappiness of many people, to the ruin, harm, and suffering of devas and humans. If, monastics, you perceive any such root of dispute, either in yourselves or in others, you should strive to abandon this evil root of dispute. And if you do not perceive any such root of dispute, either in yourself or others, you should practice so that this evil root of dispute does not emerge in the future. In such a way, this evil root of dispute is abandoned and does not emerge in the future. So there's already a little bit to unpack even in this first paragraph. And of course, these are repeated using different words and different types of uh, behaviors that lead to these disputes. But it's quite interesting to notice that um, the Buddha's pointing to uh, dwelling without respect and deference to the teacher, the Dhamma and the Sangha, as not fulfilling the training. Yeah. So that shows that this deference and respect is an essential part of training, without which it's very difficult to, or even impossible to train. Because of course, if we can't uh, take guidance, if we can't receive feedback, if we don't respect those who've walked further on this path or those who are in positions of uh, training us, even if they're not perfect, but you know, they have something to teach us, then how can we really lessen the sense of self? How can we be open to another view, another perspective? You know, sometimes we're so sure that we're right. And this idea of deference, I think, maybe especially in some kind of cultures which are more um, material or where we're kind of, highly individualistic societies sometimes people feel a little bit uh, afraid of that you know if, I, if I'm deferential does that mean I'm giving over my um, freedom of choice or a freedom of thought or my discernment but um, respect and deference doesn't necessarily mean that I think sometimes we can respect and feel deferential towards qualities that we see in others it doesn't have to be towards the person. I mean, who is the person in any case? Um, you know, obviously there may be qualities we respect and qualities that we have question marks over or we think, you know, are still yet to be developed in that person. So maybe not so much to a person, but to those things we see that are worthy of deference, deference and respect. Without those qualities, we can't fulfill the training. So it reminds me a little bit about the Kalyanamitta again being the whole of the holy life, the whole of the spiritual path. Because we need to receive something that we don't already know, some teachings that we haven't already heard, you know, some perspective, some view that, um, that opens our eyes to our blind spots. And if we're not willing to accept that we have them in the first place, then, I mean, how can we really learn? So that one stands out for me. And also um, that if it does create such a dispute in the Sangha, it leads to the harm of many people and the unhappiness of many people, the ruin, harm, and suffering of devas and humans, the harm and unhappiness of many, because of course they might lose faith in the Sangha. And if you lose faith in the Sangha, then at the very least you're missing out on so much, on so much potential to be inspired and to receive the teachings. And of course, I think it's interesting that it talks about the ruin and the harm and suffering of devas and humans. 
perhaps that lack of faith, that lack of um, harmony in the context of a sangha can actually ruin people completely. And of course, we hear about this all the time, right? We hear about um, sangha members who behave not as sangha members and really violate the precepts in, in quite revolting ways, really um, terrible ways, you know, abuse and um, sexual misconduct and all that kind of thing does happen, um, which obviously can come around through a lack of deference and respect towards the teacher, towards the Dhamma and towards the Sangha, right? It's a lack of deference and respect towards virtue itself. So we can see how that might cause the ruin of people. And the other bit that stood out to me is that the Buddha is asking the monastics that if they perceive any such root of dispute in themselves or others, they should strive to abandon it. So it doesn't just mean in oneself, I think here. It might also mean we strive to help others abandon it as well. So we don't just say, oh, okay, this person has a problem, they suffer for their own karma, I don't care, I just take care of myself. But we actually try to influence the other person to encourage them in the good and to, um, to inspire them to do better, which is maybe not so much through criticizing unless it's necessary, right? Sometimes we can criticize in skillful ways, but a lot of the time we can't. <laughs> but it might be through, you know, setting that good example. And sometimes giving feedback when it's the right time to do so. So even if we don't perceive any such root of dispute in ourselves or others, we should practice so that it does not emerge in future. And uh, there is a, a notion in the suttas of something called an anusaya uh, kilesa, which is kind of like a, a sleeping or a latent tendency or a latent kind of root, I suppose, a latent defilement that may be not always visible in the mind, but it's still present. So, for example, when somebody's done a lot of practice and there have been times that I've been really having a lot of momentum in the practice, greed and anger and all those coarser defilements simply don't arise for weeks or months, maybe even years, you know, they don't arise in their coarse form. So you can feel that, oh, I mean, I never felt this, but, you know, people can feel, oh, it's uprooted. You know, I mean, I kind of knew that it wasn't fully uprooted. I was still subject to things arising like that. But sometimes people do get deluded in those ways, especially if there's very strong samadhi practice and they simply don't seem to arise. But even then, the Buddha says, we should practice so they don't emerge in future. And I wonder if that's related to this idea of the latent tendencies, that as long as there's the roots of greed, hate, and delusion, as long as basically you're not um, a stream winner or even an anagami, because it's only in the third stage of awakening that those roots of uh, greed and um, aversion are actually taken out, then we have to continue to practice in a way that doesn't lead to them arising. So perhaps putting ourselves in conducive conditions, um, removing ourselves from unhelpful ones, such as argumentative places <laughs> or communities that aren't supporting you, perhaps. Um, maybe a relationship, you know, that's turned sour. Sometimes even family members that we need to have space from. And I think it's natural, isn't it, among family members, maybe especially parents or kids, uh, both directions, that we need to have a little break for a while or we need to visit just for a few days and not for many months um, and respect those boundaries so that we can protect our minds. So it's not the case that, oh, I need to, I should be able to deal with this. I should be able to put myself in the middle of a fire and, <laughs> and stay calm and equanimous, but rather it's like, let me see what these conditions are doing. You know, how are they affecting my mind? Is it helping the wholesome states to arise over time? Maybe some unwholesome states will arise, but is it generally going in the right direction? Or is it actually um, making difficulties for ourselves on the path? So I find this very interesting. And maybe it's already a, a good point to stop and ask if anyone has any other insights or um, anything they'd like to relate about this. Because um, there's quite a lot in there. Respect and deference. I don't know what that means to you. If anything comes up.
Anyone? Okay, so nothing yet. Also, if you don't want to speak, if you speak, then your voice is recorded, not your video. Um, but if you don't want to, you're welcome to write in the chat as well. Okay, Darren has something. Yeah, Darren, may I ask you to unmute, please? Thanks, good. Uh, thank you for the chat. Um, it wasn't the respect and deference that really struck a chord. It was more the um, the ruin and the harm and the unhappiness that it causes. Mm -hmm. And then what you were talking around that. And I think it it just it doesn't only undermine. I think it's just in that individual, in that individual teacher. But I think in the Sangha and Buddhism as a whole. Um, and if more people are doing it, then it just undermines all the Buddha teach Buddha teachings, all the suttas, um, and then people wouldn't be following it. And I just like yeah. to think that this the, the teachings bring this this balance, this equanimity into the world, this meta into the world, um, because there's so much on the other side, um, and there are so many um, departments and so many um, I don't know. It's just so easy to go off the path. Yeah. um and sort of sort of no it just realizes the the importance of the daily practice um to keep doing it because there are all these things and the roots are always going to be there and it's not just in the future and in, in this life but i think in future lives as well um but i was just always thinking about the ripple effect and that if i hear about it then i'll lose my um mm. faith um in the sangha and, and in the in the dharma but then that will impact on how i'm reacting and then yeah. that then impacts on other people and so on and so forth it just has this yeah. massive ripple effect um yeah. Yeah. just find it so so powerful and i think i just yeah. I think it's probably one of the most important things because it's you're you're not you but i mean the sangha are the, are the beacons beacons yeah. um yeah. the lighthouses in in this world um, yeah, yeah. to help us on our path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, because I think you really expanded the picture there from future, as in future in this life, maybe tomorrow or next month, to future lives, many lives this can impact us. And of course, you can see that just in terms of um, losing faith in the Sangha, not giving support to the Sangha, to the monastic Sangha, perhaps. And then the monastic sangha basically not being able to sustain themselves, you know, maybe due to the bad behavior of just a couple of individual members, how that can actually lead to um, the teachings disappearing, not being available anymore. And this is the kind of thing that happens, isn't it, when you get one or two uh, bad eggs, so to speak, in a sangha or in any religion. Yeah, and then they're talk, talked about as fundamentalist, whatever, Buddhists, Christians, Muslims. Actually, it's nothing to do with uh, Islam. It's nothing to do with Buddhism or Christianity. It's to do with wrong view in that mm -hmm. individual or wrong conduct in that individual. Um, and unfortunately, that can turn people off something that maybe has the power to give so much benefit and good in the world. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I think as it well like as... It... Yeah, go on. No, I just think it feels like a, a cancerous effect because um, mm. it only takes just a few bad cells to exactly. um, take over and it's that, yeah. but it's taken over the community and, and further afield. Thank you. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess it's also seeing that, you know, we can try not to let that cancer spread as well by maybe not always... Um, writing off a whole community because of the bad behavior of one or two but it's difficult it's difficult and it can show the bad light yeah it's also especially if it's someone who you are um who you do have a lot of faith in like for example for me if i have so much faith in my teachers and they would do something that you know i, I don't think it'd turn me against the teachings to be honest but it'd be quite devastating and for that reason we should be careful in whom we place our faith yeah, and I really liked the bit where they were saying, sorry, I know Sean's got his hand up. Mm. Um, sorry, I'm um, just finish on this. Just really liked the bit where um, if people are like that, if they are spreading that evil, but not just to um, uh, fire begets fire, evil begets evil, because um, that will just fan the flames um, as opposed to just treating them with love and kindness and compassion yeah. and showing them a different path. And um, yeah, just really liked that um, yeah. thought on it. Yeah, 
John, can you unmute? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, no, I uh, I like the way this, this does seem very powerful, doesn't it? Because it talks yeah. about, so first of all, you know, angry and hostile and those things and how deep they go and the way this covers on so many levels everything. So it, it talks about the root. So where does it come from? Mm. How to overcome it and how it can lead to not only now just dwelling, but even just dwelling, but in the future. And so the sort of, and the, the other thing is there's no fault in any of this. It's not saying, because it's very easy to say, well, you're justified. Of course you'd be angry and upset, which, you know, we've got to accept how we feel. I get that. But it's also that actually it's more about abandoning the root of it that then will stop the fit, you know, will mean we don't get so hooked on it and realizing that there's no benefit to it. Whereas there is a benefit to to abandoning it, um, you know, and and leading to any disputes then, and then it covers not just yourself, like it's, you said, but others, and it even covers Davers as well. So it's, it's so far spreading yeah. that, um, yeah, I just felt it was really quite powerful, um, and sort of yeah, this this makes sense. Um, right. And about just abandoning things. And I suppose letting go, therefore. Mm. Letting go of things. Letting go, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I had the realisation recently. I guess I've known it all the time, but I think at the moment in our community, there just seems to be so much goodwill. I mean, maybe there always is. Maybe I'm just particularly <laughs> enjoying it at the moment or receiving it more than usual because we have a place and that place is kind of this repository for goodness somehow and it seems to be almost bursting through the walls but it's also you know I often uh, reflect that when I speak to members of the community about their practice they tell me that they're doing a lot of loving kindness meditation most people have a loving kindness practice that they really focus on quite a lot and I was thinking gosh of course it feels like a very loving and harmonious community if so many of us have that as one of our main practices and the other thing that I'm sure about, I mean, not through some psychic powers, but is that the devas are present, you know? And even mm. before I left the Vihara yesterday, today, actually, this morning, I was, you know, asking the devas to stay and to protect the place because clearly they rejoice when goodness is happening. And I think they're attracted to such places and we feel safe in such places. You know, you kind of feel like there's this force field of protection, um, which is really... It, it really is tangible to the people coming through. Yeah, so, well that, also that idea you just said about having all those people with meta in one place, it's yeah. like that idea of the the sum of, say, two minds is more than yeah. equal, equal parts on their own. So by having multiple people together, it can go to a much higher level than potentially just each person doing it on their own when you come together that's probably why you feel like this overwhelming goodness. yeah it's amazing and I think that's another one I mean it's not in, explicit in this because it talks about the harm and the ruin that can happen if there are disputes but I think another type of harm and ruin is that you don't experience the benefits in other words you're not going to get out of samsara this is enough to be a harm and a ruin you know you're going to be born and take yeah, go through all that nappy changing, all that kind of <laughs> detention. I don't know what happens to you. <laughs> Heartbreak and, you know, and then obviously getting old and bones breaking and fading away uh, again and again. And this is also a kind of ruin, actually, through not practicing the positives, right? So, yeah, not to be complacent that some things are just harmful and not to be indulged at all, but also not practicing they're opposites, not doing anything to promote harmony and peace and concord and loving kindness. This is also a danger, I think. I'll, I'll just come to the chat here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks as well. I feel that loving speech is a way to show respect. Yes. I've experienced lots of disputes between teenagers, a couple of my students, when they use harsh words and then the disputes just explode. I wonder if there are any concrete tips of teaching teens to show respect to each other and their parents based on the Buddha's teaching. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. <laughs> I don't know if it talks about teens in particular. 
Um, it's very difficult. Children, teenagers in particular, are struggling with all their hormones and these changes, and they're wondering what they're doing here and what it's all about. They don't know who they are. They feel irritated. They feel frustrated. <laughs> you know, they don't really know what they're here for. I mean, that's how I felt. And I think looking back, a lot of it was hormonal, actually, because now I'm going through menopause. I experience hormones again. Very similar, but not quite as tantrum-y, but sort of <laughs> also very up and down. It's quite interesting because these things are really out of our control. So I don't know about teenagers showing respect to each other and their parents based on the Buddha's teachings. I think it's a little bit much to ask. Um, I think it's, I don't know because I'm not a teenager anymore and I'm also not in the teaching role to teens. But ideally, I think what everybody wants from their parents is to feel a sense of unconditional love and acceptance, even when they're grumpy and sad and, you know, not being well behaved, that the parent who's older and who's gone through this can kind of rationalize, well, you know, they're, they're going through a lot of changes, they don't really know what's happening to their body even, never mind their mind. Um, and just tell them that, okay, they, they're going to make mistakes. They're not always going to do the right thing, but you're there for them anyway. I think this is one of the things that parents can do. Um, for teachers, I don't know, but I know that at some point, it's a shame because I was a straight A student, but then <laughs> in my GCSEs, I was really quite depressed and I didn't see the point in anything. And I literally didn't study at all the year before my GCSEs. I still passed most of them, but I did get an E in economics and it, I, I've never had an E. I've never even had hardly a C and I had an E in economics. And actually, I was really happy about that because <laughs> I didn't like economics, hence I'm a non. Uh, <laughs> but I actually think it was too much pressure because the most important thing to me was to feel a sense of meaning and I didn't have one at that time so yeah I don't know maybe it could be possible to introduce things like love and kindness and meditation but not in an attempt to fix the teen because that would have made me run a mile but I think I don't know part of me would have been quite interested in the teachings on suffering and you know the purpose the meaning of life I think that would have interested me a lot. Maybe also to point out that the Buddha really rebelled against society. <laughs> he found his own path. You know, he gave himself time. I think if teenagers could actually take time and maybe go traveling for a while before they decide to go to uni, that would be great. Hmm. Anyway, I'm a bit of a rebel, so. I don't know if that's any, any use. <laughs> Um, Shell, sorry, Gunter, I'm jumping in. <laughs> um, I just wanted to share a little story that came to mind very briefly because I used to be a secondary school teacher um, and I used to, uh, I hated all the school rules because there's just so many rules for the kids and um, after, I always had the ethos that you respect Others in your classroom, you respect me, I respect you, and I respect everyone. And it was just about that. That was the only rule. So by Christmas, I dropped all the other school rules. And so the following term after Christmas, I've forgotten which class this was now. Um, I used to teach maths and it was quite challenging. And I worked in challenging schools. But there was this one incident where the kid was just mucking around and started creating havoc in the classroom. And I just looked over to him and he... By the time I'd even looked over at him, he was already walking out of the classroom because I'd asked the kids to leave the classroom just to have a word with them outside, to check in with them, see how they're doing. And so I was quite impressed that he was already taking himself outside the classroom without me even asking. And as soon as I came out of the classroom, he was just so apologetic. He was like, I was so disrespectful. I'm really sorry. And I've come out because I knew that I've done wrong. And it was just so lovely. But it, it took me months to be able to get to that a place with the teenagers to just be like mm. well just respect each other and it is this buddhist teaching of you know respect the differences not everyone in your class is your friend um but it was so beautiful that moment yeah. it was really cool yay it's great isn't it sometimes it takes time <laughs> yeah yeah okay darren did you want to say something else yeah darren can you unmute again please Sorry, me again. Um, it just reminded me, my, my children, um, my son's just turned 20 
uh, earlier this year and my daughter's gonna be 19 in September we've just been through this and and I think it's just what you're saying that unconditional love and support and just knowing that it will pass but also just still leading by example um so when they are um at each other's throats and um and just verbally just um just knowing that the following the following day they'll be curled up on the sofa watching a film together um and supporting each other and it's just this cycle and it's just the hormones going through and then finding their identity and knowing that they're just gonna irritate and annoy each other but just keep bringing them back to um love and compassion of each other um and just continue to support that um mm -hmm. whereas i think if if we're i don't know if i was feeding that and agreeing with each with either of them, um, or I was acting like that towards um, their mum, then that almost um, makes it okay. Um, mm, yeah. I can't think of the right word now, but it, uh, no, thank you. Yeah, normalizes it. Whereas what we're trying to do is normalize the love and kindness mm. um, to each other. And what they're going through isn't real, it's just a moment in time of their emotions. Um, and they, yeah, and now they're. When they get together they're they're yeah they're really close and yeah. they'll have their moments but it's just more ribbing um and just knowing that you just keep supporting them with love and kindness and unconditionally and, and it will pass um yeah. hopefully that's anyway brilliant. that's brilliant yeah because that's the loving kindness and the wisdom on the part of the parent the, the understanding of impermanence that keeps you cool <laughs> Yeah, because I think when you show the teen that you're worried about them, they also think, oh, there must be something wrong with me, you know, I must be bad, or, and then they feel ashamed, and it just makes the whole thing worse, or they feel judged or whatever. Um, so the word that came to mind as well when you were speaking was positive reinforcement, you know, kind of praising them for the things they do do and kind of showing them that example, and then maybe almost overlooking the other stuff, unless, of course, it's really intense, but then giving that loving space. Yeah. 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 Pia, may I ask you to move, please? Yes, I just wanted to add, uh, I'm really grateful to Benny Rakanda because I don't remember where exactly, but you once said something about consistent kindness or something like that, consistent kindness. And even if like you don't feel it that moment, but be kind with your teenager. I mean, my teenager is turning 14 with special needs. And uh, last last night, we we were supposed to have a dispute because, you know, he did something really unwholesome and he was like very apologetic. And genuinely, genuinely, because I've been doing my practice recently, I didn't feel any, uh, you know, like any, any feeling arising. Like all I keep saying was like, you know, we still love you. Thank you for, you know, we still love you. You know, we recognize that, you know, you you have recognized, you are aware that you, what you did was in, you know, uh, what we we expect from you, but we still love you. And 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 he was very like, no, but you should be, uh, you know, um, angry towards me and that kind of thing. You know? So I think when you said that consistent kindness is so, so true. And I just wanted to say that how, um, he's here by the way, how, um, how lucky and um, how blessed I feel by following your advice. Thank you. Oh, well done, because it's you that's practicing it. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. It's also that I think teenagers do feel ashamed if they do anything wrong. I had this feeling like I was a terrible teenager and I knew I wasn't, but I kind of had this fear that maybe I really was, you know, and I think they know that, you know, some of their behavior is less than desirable, but they just can't help it because it's that time in their life. So that's really beautiful. And also the skill in sort of saying what you did was not desirable, what you did wasn't skillful, rather than you are blah, blah. You know, this, there's a big difference there. Very well done. How inspiring. <laughs> that's great. Okay. All right, anything else on this? It's interesting that on the subject of deference and respect, the subject teenagers came up most. <laughs> it's quite interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the time you really want to be that respectful necessarily because you want to figure out your own way sometimes. Uh, someone else is saying, oh, hang on. I have missed a couple of things in the box. Okay. 
I made some bad experiences with a spiritual teacher I had a lot of trust in and now find it difficult to feel difference towards particularly male teachers. What you said, Venchanda, about focusing on certain beautiful qualities of people rather than demanding the whole person to be perfect resonated deeply because there's always seems to be something positive to focus on. Yeah, good, good. Good, yeah. And um, yeah, that's within maybe even the same individual, but also realizing that um, even if one person's misbehaved in some way, it doesn't mean everyone else with the same gender or in the same similar position or, you know, sometimes it's like association, isn't it? Someone reminds you of somebody else and there's like a lack of trust there. Um, to realize that everybody's so different and um, one person's behavior doesn't reflect on Dhamma, actually. It reflects on their own shortcomings, their own um, areas or blind spots that, you know, they haven't yet seen. Um, so good, wonderful, if you can actually focus on some of those beautiful qualities and also if you have, um, if you just can't trust a person, don't force yourself to, really don't um because it's almost like you're giving your heart to some i mean it's more than that it's more than even a romantic relationship or anything because there you can kind of get out but when you give your trust spiritually to somebody that is incredible amount of trust and vulnerability involved because you're talking about your mind you're telling them i mean i tell my teachers everything but i really select them carefully you know um it's almost like we kind of know instinctively sometimes if we can trust someone or not. Sometimes we're too quick, but if you have any doubt, then just, you know, respect them from a little bit more of a distance. I think that's important. And, um, and yeah, focus on the good qualities for your own benefit. Okay. One of my sons did something seriously wrong. Not mine. I'm reading a comment. <laughs> One of my sons did something seriously wrong. He asked me if that made him a bad person. Very worried. I think you mean that he was very worried. Is that right? Or Yeah, he was very worried about that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. None of us want to be bad. And unfortunately, I think this might come from a kind of I don't want to blame religions, but the way we're taught maybe in our cultures is that there's something in us that's bad, that's innately bad and guilt is almost a virtue, but it's not a virtue. Um, it's interesting that in some other cultures, especially Tibetan Buddhist cultures actually, and maybe, I don't know about Burmese Buddhist cultures, less so than here, but certainly I think in Tibetan Buddhist culture, um, they don't really have that sense of guilt or taking it as I am bad. They more see it as something bad they've done. Um, and it's many steps away, <laughs> you know, because behavior is something that's changing all the time. It's something that's obviously quite easy to modify. But if it's actually says something about you as a sort of unfixed, unchangeable being, then really you're doomed, aren't you? So absolutely not. And uh, one of the things that's skillful about Ajahn Brahm is that he never says, oh, he never gives me the impression that I'm a bad person, but he also never gives me the impression that I'm a good person either. <laughs> he just doesn't see or view people in terms of beings, like as in fixed people. He more praises for the good behaviors and the skillful things that one does. I've asked him before, you know, why do you kind of trust me and and, you know, kind of give me so much support and um support the project and he said oh it's because you're very committed that's not really me as a person that's like because of something i'm doing because of my commitment that he's seeing over a long period of time and of course there's other qualities that he can point out but he sees them as like qualities that are cultivated so yeah hopefully you told him that there's no such thing as a fixed person at all he's a work in progress <laughs> mm. a different view taking up the tibetan and muslim view i have encountered is that one would say in those circumstances i love you but sometimes i do not love the things you do yeah correct mm. exactly 
This is very nice. <laughs> it's nice to see your son, Bea. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you there. <laughs> okay. So I don't see more comments. So let's continue with this. So there's a lot of dot, dot, dots, but I think I will read out one more in full because sometimes it's nice to hear the whole paragraph. It helps it sink in, which is why, of course, they did repeat. It was um, a verbal tradition and um, there was no way of recording anything other than by repeating it and memorizing these verses. So the next one that causes the same problems. Here, a monastic or anybody else Mm. This is interesting because it says, is a denigrator and insolent, but I prefer to say denigrates <laughs> and is insolent. Yeah. Here, a person is denigrates or is a denigrator and insolent. When a person denigrates and is insolent, they dwell without, is that right? Yeah, they dwell without respect and deference, right, toward the teacher the Dhamma and the Sangha, and they do not fulfill the training. Such a person creates a dispute in the Sangha that leads to the harm of many people, to the unhappiness of many people, to the ruin, harm, and suffering of devas and humans, if monastics or people, community, you perceive any such root of dispute either in yourselves or in others, you should strive to abandon this evil root of dispute. And if you do not perceive any such root of dispute, either in yourselves or in others, you should practice so that the evil root of dispute does not emerge in the future. In such a way, this evil root of dispute is abandoned and does not emerge in the future. So actually, these are all ways of showing disrespect and lack of deference aren't they so these are the qualities that lead to that disrespect so the next one is when one is envious and miserly one dwells without respect and deference towards the teacher dhamma and the sangha when one is crafty and hypocritical <laughs> One dwells without respect and deference toward the teacher, the Dhamma and the Sangha and does not fulfill the training. When one has evil desires and wrong view. When one adheres to one's own views, holds to them tenaciously and relinquishes them with difficulty. Such a person dwells without respect and deference towards the teacher, the Dhamma and the Sangha and does not fulfill the training. They create a dispute in the Sangha that leads to the harm of many people, to the unhappiness of many people, to the ruin, harm and suffering of devas and of humans. If, community, you perceive any such root of dispute, either in yourselves or in others, you should strive to abandon this evil root of dispute. And if you do not perceive any such root of dispute, either in yourselves or in others, you should practice so that this evil root of dispute does not arise, sorry, emerge, is that right? Emerge in the future. In such a way, this evil root of dispute is abandoned and does not emerge in the future. These monks or monastics are the six roots of dispute. Hmm. That left me with a really positive feeling that if we do these things, they do not arise, they do not emerge in the future. Can you imagine that? If there are no possibilities within one's mind for these things to arise that would cause a lack of respect and deference, that would prevent you from fulfilling the training that would cause any unhappiness or harm or suffering or ruin to others. So this is the Buddha's promise as well. It's often couched in the negative, but we have to see it that way too. It's possible that these things don't ever emerge. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? So really the community, the everyday life is our kind of um, a 
kind of laboratory <laughs> to practice these things and to see if we can live in ways, think in ways, develop right view in ways that doesn't lead to these things arising. I think it's nice that it's now going beyond things that are obvious, um, unskillful qualities like denigration, being insolent, envious, miserly, crafty and hypocritical. Maybe a little bit more secretive one, isn't it? Not so overt. It moves from these into evil desires and wrong view and holding to one's own view tenaciously, relinquish them with difficulty. So this is now going more into the teachings of the Buddha because there is such a thing as wrong view. The Buddha defines that very clearly in certain ways. Um, and this too is the cause of such dispute, a lack of reverence and respect. So of course, one of those aspects of a uh, wrong view is the view of a self. <laughs> that somebody's a bad person or even a good person or even a Muslim person or a Buddhist person. This is all um, actually part of wrong view. Is that true? What do you think? I mean, sometimes we have to use these terminologies, obviously, to kind of give people an idea of the way we um, view life, right? It wouldn't work for me to say I'm a Christian because that's further from the truth than to say that I'm a Buddhist. But to think that I'm anything at all, as the nun Vajira said in the Terigata, she said, for one who thinks that anything at all is fit for Mara to address. So that was when Mara, this kind of force or personification of, uh, of negativity, of evil, if you like, came to her and said, who do you think you are, a woman? How can you achieve wisdom as a woman, you know? with your two-fingered uh, wisdom, he said, because apparently they used to pinch the rice grain or something to see if it was cooked. And she said, oh, to one who thinks I am a woman or I am a man or I am anything at all, only they, those people are fit for Mara to address. And then she described herself just like a chariot put together with little pieces and hooks and I don't know what they link the pieces of chariots together with. Um, that basically saying it can all be taken apart and you can find that there's nothing there. And that's what the Buddha tries to do, beginning with this uh, right view, at least to have the understanding that what we're actually seeing here is not a person, but it's um, basically the components of the five khandhas, right? Or the components of existence. There's feeling, there's form, there's perception, there's consciousness there's sankara that's that's probably what this is talking about mostly the sankara the reaction which is often unskillful we react by being envious or by being crafty or insolent you know it's all a reaction to suffering isn't it really at the heart of it or a reaction to frustrated desires um this is not who we are <laughs> These are just mental states that arise and pass. And uh, actually, I'm not sure that that was Vajira. That was another bhikkhuni who said, uh, yeah, was that Soma or was it, um, was it Soma? I think it was. The one who said uh, about being, not be, you know, being a woman or a man, I think that was Soma. But then um, bhikkhuni Vajira was the one that said basically, all that exists for her through the eyes of an arahat is just suffering arising and suffering passing away. Both these bhikkhunis were fully enlightened. So when we can see it's just suffering arising, suffering passing away, we're less likely to take ownership of it, get stuck on it, get attached to it, take it as who we are, you know, feel guilty about it. We can see it's just arising, it's passing, you know. And when it passes, of course, that's a certain level of peace. So the right view, the not holding on. And being able to relinquish our views. <laughs> Any thoughts on this? 
Ah, yes, Teddy Sella. I think that she's also, it might be Sela, but in another sutta, it's not Sela. It's attributed to two different bikunis, Sela and somebody else, possibly Soma or possibly Vajira. Yeah. Anyway, let's say it's uh, Sela for, for now. Yeah. The chariot simile. And it should be Teddy. So it's like T E T H E R I. That means elder, like Teddy Gata. Just a typo. Any thoughts on how right view might help us to overcome this kind of anger and lack of respect and deference or any other comments? How do we abandon right view? And someone's saying, maybe I am the owner of my own karma. Now, that's an interesting one. <laughs> I think the translation does say, I am the owner of my karma. Here you've got my own karma. <laughs> and this is one of the difficulties, isn't it? To a certain extent, that's true in the sense that whatever action we perform, there will be a result of that. And, you know, there will be the experience of that result. But I asked Ashram Pram about this once because I said, surely we don't really own our karma. Because if you did, I mean, how would there be an, a possibility to transcend that karma? How would there be any possibility for freedom? And he said, it's just for the putta jana that this holds true. It's just for the unenlightened person that this is true conventionally. But of course, there's actually no one owning any of this. And it's the realization of non-self that frees oneself from guilt because one realizes that whatever one's done in the past, basically it was causally arisen. There was nobody doing it and they're able to let go of guilt and therefore able to let go of some of those effects that would lead them to a lower, a lower birth. So they're able to actually transcend karma that way through the realization of non-self. Otherwise, I mean, we'd be doomed, wouldn't we, if we'd done any bad actions in the past that could have the potential to lead to a lower state of rebirth or a lower state of mind, and we had to experience the effects of that, then there'd be no way out. But isn't it interesting that when one sees non-self as a stream winner, they can no longer be reborn in those lower realms. So Ajahn Brown says that's mainly because there's no more guilt. There's, when there's no sense of self, there's no one to reap that karma in a sense. This is quite deep, and I don't expect anyone to kind of really comment or, or kind of understand that. Even I can't really comprehend that, right? Um, but it makes sense. And um, in the forgiveness retreat that myself and Venerable Pekka taught last week in Cambridge, um, I quoted Ajahn Brahmali as saying that until you're a stream winner, it's actually hard to completely forgive precisely for the same reason, because there's still that sense of guilt that you had a choice somehow and you feel bad that you did something wrong because you think you had a somehow a choice. You think there's an agent in there that's independent of conditioning, right? But when you realize that there's nothing but a causal process, then guilt disappears. It's like feeling guilty that the flower blooms on a Wednesday and not a Friday or something. <laughs> or, the, <laughs> or that, you know, the, the tree falls over. It falls over because of causes. It doesn't fall over because, you know, of anything inherent in it. It's, it's nature. It's just, it's just nature playing itself out. But this is very hard for us to understand. Because then the, anyway, I'm talking too much, but then the, I'm <laughs> thinking out loud, really, but. You know, it's hard for us to understand because I think the common question that comes next is, well, if, you know, it's all causal, then are we not responsible? Does that mean we can be irresponsible? But that's not what the Buddha teaches either. He's actually saying, as I understand it, to be careful about the causes that we plant, you know, and to, um, to be careful about our intention more than anything else. He says that karma is intention. So it's those three right intentions which come immediately after right view that we can, we can cultivate. You know, we can try to see where we're coming from 
And are our intentions aligned with kindness, compassion, non-harm, non-cruelty, letting go, selflessness, if you like, generosity, giving, rather than holding on. So to some extent we can influence, and I think that's why we have to be so careful of the conditions that we, uh, we kind of create around us or, or allow ourselves to be in. And have a little bit of trust that if you are in good conditions, if you are coming to Dhamma talks, if you are trying to visit monasteries or cultivate spiritual friendships, that that is going to take you on the path. So it's, I don't know, are we the owners of our karma? We certainly learn through our own direct experience what the results of certain thoughts or, or deeds are. We can learn that within ourselves. But I think uh, whether we own that or not is another question. <laughs> yeah. Certainly we experience it. No one else experiences it. But of course, our actions have impacts on others as well. Any more thoughts around this? Or shall we? There's only 10 more minutes, really. I don't know if it's worth reading a little bit on into the next sutta. How are people feeling? Yeah, can continue a bit. Okay. Let's see how many pages. Oh, it's quite a lot of pages. I find this interesting, though, because um, I don't know if any of you know here, this one's called Schism in the Sangha. And sometimes people have criticized Ajahn Brown, believe it or not, <laughs> for creating a so-called schism. I wouldn't say schism in the Sangha because the Sangha is pretty huge, right? But some kind of split. Of course, he never actually split himself off. Um, and you can read here what a real schism is, because, of course, that wasn't one at all. Uh, there was no divided sangha there, because every sangha makes its own decisions. Um, and if one part of the sangha or a particular monastery decides that they don't want to be affiliated with another, that's, that's more politics. That's more kind of your affiliations with certain groups. That's nothing to do with a divided sangha as such. So... These are the actual causes for a schism in the Sangha and how it comes to be. So Sangha here means monastic community, but I'm pretty sure we'll be able to relate this to other situations as well. So the Venerable Upali was actually the Vinaya expert, just to give some background. And this is um, Venerable Upali approaching the Blessed One. So the Venerable Upali approached the Blessed One, the Buddha, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and said to him, Bante, it is said, schism in the Sangha, schism in the Sangha. How, Bante, is there a schism in the Sangha? And then the Buddha replies, Here, Upali, number one, monks or monastics explain non-dhamma as dhamma and dhamma as non-dhamma. Right? They explain non-discipline as discipline and discipline as non-discipline. They explain what has not been stated. They explain what has not been stated and uttered by the Tathagata as having been stated and uttered by him. And, they, and what has been stated and uttered by the Tathagata as not having been stated stated and uttered by him. <laughs> you can see the distortion going on. Huh? They explain what has not been practiced by the Tathagata, this is the Buddha, as having been practiced by him. They explain what has not been practiced by the Tathagata as having been practiced by him. And what has been prescribed by the Tathagata as not having been prescribed by him. Oh, and the opposite, what has not been prescribed as having been prescribed by him. On these 10 grounds, they withdraw and go apart. They perform legal acts separately and recite the Patimoka separately. It is in this way, Upali, that there is a schism in the Sangha. 
Okay. Hello, Filippo. I can see Filippo. Hi. <laughs> so this is very interesting, isn't it? Because this is all about misunderstanding the teachings and promoting things the Buddha hasn't hadn't said or prescribed or taught as things he has said, prescribed, taught, and practiced, etc. So it's really getting the Dhamma wrong. It's perhaps more around wrong view. And I don't know if you remember the six, uh, um, what are they called? Uh, principles of cordiality. There's also the 10 principles of cordiality, but among the six principles of cordiality, there's that they dwell with loving kindness and they dwell um, in public and private with loving kindness in body, speech, and mind. They share generously whatever gains have been offered. And also that they hold in common virtues praised by the noble ones and right view so these things were actually causes for the harmony and for the um for the harmony in the sangha and here we're saying that it's uh the differences in doctrine that cause real schisms so you could even say one group are true disciples of the buddha and the other are not so it's almost a natural schism, isn't it? Some, rather than something contrived, it's actually a difference in the way of practice. And accordingly, they can't recite and practice the Patimokkha because that is actually the, the training rules. So if you're training differently, I don't think you can come together and uh, meet on common ground there. So then they go off and do these things separately. So I'll read the opposite as well, because this is always much more positive. So Bante, and Bante just means venerable. Bante, it is said, concord in the Sangha, concord in the Sangha. How is there concord in the Sangha? Here, Upali, number one, the monastics explain non-dhamma as non-dhamma and dhamma as dhamma. They're the first pair. They explain non-discipline as non-discipline and discipline as discipline. Second pair. They explain what has not been stated and uttered by the Tathagata as not having been stated and uttered by him. And what has been stated and uttered by the Tathagata as having been stated and uttered by him. And the last pair. They explain what has not been practiced by the Tathagata as not having been practiced by him and what has been practiced by the Tathagata as having been practiced by him. Oops, there's one more pair. They explain what has not been prescribed by the Tathagata as not having been prescribed by him, and what has been prescribed by the Tathagata as having been prescribed by him. On these 10 grounds, they do not withdraw and go apart. They do not perform legal acts separately, or recite the Patimokkha separately. It's in this way, Upali, that there is concord in the Sangha. It's so lovely. It reminds me of when Ajahn Pramali was here and how there was so much concord. There was so much harmony and mutual understanding because we all studied and understood the teachings in the same way. And I had so much fun talking to him about early Buddhism because <laughs> I'm kind of quite clear on what I think the Buddha taught, of course, and it agrees with Ajahn Pramali, which is very nice. And we here might all think, yeah, of course, you know, but it's not the case in uh, for all practitioners, even all Buddhist practitioners. And I guess there's a common teacher there, Arjun Brown, but also we both have a love of the suttas. So we read the suttas a lot. And it kind of points towards that, doesn't it? The importance of understanding what the Buddha taught and taking an interest in that and having that as our guide. Perhaps it's not only that we have the right view, but that we don't have our own views, right? Because if you don't read the suttas, if you don't take the Buddha as your ultimate teacher, you can add all kinds of stuff. And I don't know with one of you here who expressed that lack of um, or, or loss of faith in a teacher. I don't know if it was a monastic teacher, but sometimes the trouble is when we don't um, take the Buddha as our ultimate sort of authority in a sense, we can kind of get onto a bit of an ego trip and start thinking, 
well, you know, I'm not quite sure about this thing. Maybe that was cultural. I'll just tweak it here, tweak it there. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, uh, no alcohol is okay for people in India, but nowadays we have control. We can take a glass or two or whatever else it might be. You know, we start kind of overlaying our own preferences without realizing that's a lot of ego coming in. And I think that's one of the reasons it's so helpful to have a proper training system, including the full ordination. It's quite interesting. I can't help resist really bring this up because it's important. But um, one of the things that was uttered and stated by the Tathagata is that um, bhikkhunis are important. Yeah, having fully ordained nuns as well as fully ordained monks and lay women, lay men, and everything in between, or every person basically represented in the community, um, was the Buddha's plan all along. That was his wish, and he actually said he wouldn't pass away until that was fulfilled. Not only that there were such people, but that they were um, deeply, deeply rooted in the Dhamma, both in theory and in practice. Uh, in other words, that there were enlightened people in every group. And it was only then that he passed away. And that was because he said that would be the cause for Buddhism to last for generations. And from my experience now, uh, practicing in England for a while, I can feel that the Buddhism is getting stronger because we're bringing really good teachers over. We're having like people coming to, to the Dhamma, including the generosity aspect, the community aspect, right speech, kind of Dhamma discussion, all of that, that you simply don't get on a lay retreat, you know, or in any retreat that's not, um, you know, integrated into your life. So for me, it's very obvious that this brings a lot of joy to the community, but it also brings a lot of joy to the Sangha as well. And we have quite a few supportive monks in Oxford now who just treat us like sisters. They don't treat it like it's anything strange, you know. We see them, they see us, we swap notes, <laughs> we share sores. <laughs> that was Ben and Rebecca's great way into getting to know the monks. Like, well, can, have you got a saw? Have you got a screwdriver? <laughs> She just wants to have one. <laughs> it's not that she's trying to make friends, but <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's really great, and um, it's clearly something that the Buddha uh, made happen, made possible, and took and, and put a lot of uh, time and investment into. You know, he trained his nuns. He didn't just say, "Right, off you go. You're on your own." He gave them teachings, really profound teachings that work. And uh, so this also could cause a split. Maybe it's a natural split that can happen, you know, if somebody's not actually fulfilling the Buddha's teachings in that way for one reason or another. So I also think that Ajahn Brahmali has written something very lovely, it really touched me quite deeply for our newsletter, which is coming out hopefully tomorrow, depending if I can get it done. Um, but it's really quite touching because it kind of associates having bhikkhunis with bringing early Buddhism to a place. And that to me is the biggest kind of word of encouragement that he's made that connection and, and actually sees that as one of the benefits because that's the whole point. I mean, this isn't some trip, like let's be a bhikkhuni trip. <laughs> I can practice more deeply, you know, as a nun somewhere in Burma, not in Burma anymore, sadly. But, um, you know, I can have a much more meditative life without being a bhikkhuni, maybe, maybe. And that's not to, I mean, the bhikkhuni ordination is much more powerful to take you all the way. But it's not easy. It's not an easy choice. Um, but really, this is to bring the Buddha's teachings in their integrity, um, both having integrity and being a whole, you know, being complete. Um, to to everybody in our society so anyway he says something really nice so anyway that will be coming out in the newsletter soon and i've talked my way through this without giving you much time to comment at the end um i don't know maybe i should ask if there's any pressing question from anyone who hasn't yet uh, asked or commented on today's sutta because we did get through quite a bit more just now is there any last uh thing to say and if there is and you didn't get time you can come to the meta session tomorrow and ask <laughs> it doesn't have to be only on meta 
but tomorrow we're going to do some meta practice in the morning from nine till 10 UK time. So, uh, okay, I'll just read that little comment out here. I find it helps to practice metta to both myself and the feelings and others. And that helps me to develop wisdom. Yay. The path to wisdom through love. Isn't that wonderful? That'd be a good title for talk. That's really good. I've recently, oh, sorry. I've started reading suttas recently, but I'm always blown away by how insightful they all are. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, brilliant. So I'm going to pass to whoever's doing the dana talk now, just for a couple of minutes, and then um, I'll let you know what's happening with me and what's happening with the teachings for the next while. And uh, just express my gratitude to you all. Yeah. Anyone? Thank you so much, Venerable Chanda. Um, as always, we're so grateful for you to bring these teachings to us. Um, it feels weird, actually, that this is the last one of this, uh, well, year before your rains retreat. And I remember sitting in this equivalent one last year. So I think um, I can hopefully speak on behalf of everyone, which I don't probably want to do, but I, we really wish you well on your rains retreat. Well, I'm sure we're all going to miss you lots. Um, we're really grateful that you have the opportunity to go and practice because you give so much to this community, um, not just the suitor classes, all the online teachings, all the support and that you are doing for the Sangha. Um, so what we can do um, as lay people to support the Sangha, the Anakampa Sangha, Venerable Chanda, and hopefully in the future, more people that will be joining the Sangha, the monastic Sangha, uh, at this time is to, if you can, donate towards Anukampa project. Um, the money that you donate uh, will go towards advancing the teachings to more people, as well as advancing the uh, Anukampa Bhikkhuni project, both the monastic Sangha, and hopefully we're looking in the future, near future, to get a bigger place. Um, what we've seen this year is that it's been so full uh, and so there's been so much generosity already. Um, so we are getting close to the next step of being able to look for a bigger Sangha, but we a bigger uh, monastery, a bigger Vihara, but we won't be able to do that without your support. So please do, if you can, however much you can, small or big, to donate towards the project. Um, as we're having a, a bit of a break now in person at the Vihara, as Venerable Chanda is on long retreat, we're not uh, currently asking for uh, donations in the form of dana. However, dana will resume after Ajahn Brahm's tour. Food. So if you uh, so a food dana, yeah. Um, so if you do wish to do that, it will be later on this year, and you are able to email team at anukampaproject.org um, to speak with them about available dates to offer that later on this year, um, and also. There will be the opportunity again to visit the Vahara to offer uh, volunteer and support Venerable Chanda and hopefully other bikunis as well. Um, but that will be, I think, early next year will be most likely when there's space. But again, please do drop an email to team at anacamperproject.org. So from all of us, Venerable Chanda, uh, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for your generosity to support the project. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Shell. Say these things so lovely. <laughs> and uh, oops, I seem to have pinned us both now. I don't know why. I'll remove you. <laughs> we were there for a moment together, which is lovely. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, just to um, explain a little bit about those timings. Um, we are actually full in the Vihara now, like right up till Jan. It's not that it's not open, but um, from about, from after Ajahn's tour, you're welcome to come and visit. During Ajahn's tour, we don't have like in-person dana, but we have like a small team who look after him and myself so that we keep it really quiet because we're teaching so, well, he is teaching so much. So we're really busy. Um, so after that, from about the 21st of November, you can come and offer dana. Um, and yeah, we do have guests throughout November, December now, but it's full, can you believe? And then in January, not sure yet, I might have a kind of private retreat with just one or two people by invitation. And then, um, yeah, it'll be functioning fully for guest bookings from the end of Jan. 
So anyway, there's loads of time and I'll be back in November. So we'll book you in at that time. Um, I just want to, I'm going to try and say it in the newsletter. It sounds gushy, you know, when you say it in these newsletters, because words are so difficult, but I just really, I can't remember ever feeling this full up with joy and gratitude and amazement, really, uh, in the power of the Dhamma and the power of community and everything we've achieved together. And that includes everybody, no matter how much you think you've contributed, it's been enormous. And I just can't ever remember leaving with such a happy heart. Um, it's almost like if I wasn't going to my veins, I wouldn't be like edging to go. And normally I'm just like really collapsing into it, quite frankly. It's like, can I survive another week, month, six months? You know, I'm just kind of falling over with the stress and the effort it's taken to get this far. But now I think especially because we have a place it really is a community. It's not just that I see people on a screen and know they're there, but don't feel them. I feel you. I feel the love. And I'm so nourished. I'm really so nourished. I've just been waking up feeling so joyful, even on very little sleep. So I'm in such a good place, really, thanks to everybody who's been coming and also to the Zoom. Um, really such a good place to go into the retreat and uh, just to say, you know, these retreats are not a break in the project. They're actually something that deepens it in ways we can't really imagine. Because I think even if I wouldn't deepen my own practice, which is inevitable to some extent, um, it's the example of somebody who's able, you know, of, of all of us, right? It's, it's just, I have the opportunity, but all of us can do this to take a break and to just say, now's the time for retreat. So it's that leading by example, because when I do something, I do it fully. When I work, I work <laughs> hard, you know, and I put everything I've got into it. And it's kind of similar for retreat. So um, I think this is really what Anukampa is about. It's about furthering ourselves on the path, you know, creating opportunities for all of us to deepen our practice, but in particular for people who've given their whole life to this, to really take it as far as they possibly can in this life. And that is what's going to feed the community for time to come. So I don't think I'll get enlightened in this retreat. <laughs> Who knows? You know, no expectation, right? But anyway, it's just an incredible opportunity and one that you have all helped create. So I'll be thinking of you all and sending lots and lots of metta and knowing that I couldn't be here without any of you. Um, so really... Truly thank you. Deep thanks to everybody. And uh, please take care. You've got loads of Dharma resources. The previous recordings, there's more recordings that we haven't yet put up. We also have a program throughout the summer, every single Sunday. There's only two Sundays in the next four months, which is a lay peer-led session. And even that will be nice because you'll hear a talk probably of mine and you'll discuss together. You'll get in small groups and it'll be nice. But every other week, every week, Apart from those two, there'll be a bikini or someone else to teach you. So, and I'll see you tomorrow morning if you can come. Uh, uh, for those who can't, take care. All right. <laughs> oh, thank you. Bye. You can unmute if you want to wave goodbye.